Welcome everybody to the results action call for, we're up to July already, 2017, can you believe it? End of July, uh, I don't know where the year's gone myself and I think probably a lot of people are feeling a similar way. Um, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that wherever we're calling from around the country, we are on land that uh, is, was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, sovereignty was never ceded and we acknowledge uh, elders past and present, um, as well as elders from other communities who may be here today. Today, we will be following our usual format. Uh, we'll start with a bit of an inspiring story. Um, we will hear from, I'll introduce our callers to our guest speaker and our guest speaker to our callers. Our guest speaker, who today is Paul O'Callaghan from Caritas, uh, he will be speaking, uh, taking some questions. So please do think about whether you've got some questions you'd like to ask to get a little bit more detail. And then we'll be hearing about some announcements and some of the success stories uh, we've been having. And then we'll finish off by doing an activity together to help us get into action, uh, which today we'll be doing a laser talk, which we haven't done for a while. So a bit of a throwback for those who know the laser talk. Um, a reminder that when you wanna uh, ask a question using Zoom, um, there is a raise hand button. Um, if you're on the phone, you won't have a raise hand button. Uh, so you know, don't, feel free to just um, unmute yourself, say your name and introduce yourself. And uh, I would like to also uh, just share in the chat box for anyone who is on Zoom and able to see it. Um, I'll just put the link for this month's action in there. So if you don't have um, an action sheet in front of you, then you can open that up and have it in front of you now if you like. Uh, if you don't have one and you're on the phone, it's no big deal. You'll still be able to follow what's going on. Um, but to kick us off today, I would like to introduce Michelle, who is one of our staff members at Results, um, and she'll just share a little bit about what's been inspiring her lately. Michelle. Thanks, Gina. Good afternoon, everyone. For those who haven't met me, I'm Results Global Health Campaign Manager, and I work mainly on tuberculosis, or TB. I'm sorry I can't join you on Zoom today. I'm out and about this afternoon, but this is still an inspiring story anyway. I'm sure you'll still enjoy hearing it. So everyone probably heard at least a little bit about the G20 Leaders Summit earlier this month. It was a meeting of the heads of the world's 20 largest economies. Our Prime Minister was there, among other leaders. And the Leaders Declaration, which was released at the end of that meeting, is a statement of the G20's joint priorities for the next year. And it actually contained a significant win for results in our international advocacy partners that kicks off a crucial year for TB globally. If you participated in any of the action calls last year, you might recall that TB, one of the most ancient human diseases, is shockingly, once again, the world's deadliest infectious disease killer. And it's particularly relevant to Australia because 60% of the global TB burden is in our region. Worse still, TB is a bacterial infection. And you might know that antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, is an increasingly urgent global health problem. Drug-resistant forms of TB are the single greatest cause of AMR-related deaths annually, and we have to get better at accurately diagnosing and quickly treating TB, and ultimately finding a vaccine that works for everyone. In a section of the Leader's Declaration titled Combating AMR, the Declaration singled out TB and highlighted the importance of research and development, or R&D, the need to maximise the impact of existing tools for TB, and to develop market incentives for finding new ones. This is the first time a G20 Leaders Declaration has singled out a specific disease like this. We and our G20 advocacy partners worked all year to make sure that TB got the attention it needed in these discussions. And even if that meant we worked with some different people and institutions, we still use techniques that would be very familiar to you and your advocacy. So, we had to make a strong, well-argued case to key influences that touched on the regional and national interests involved. We used our existing relationships with people who have better access than we do to those who need to hear these arguments directly. We made new relationships with people whose special knowledge meant they had positions of influence. We made our case in the media, either through others or for ourselves. And we thanked people we'd met with and when we'd secured the outcomes we sought. So now TB is at the centre of global political attention. Over the next year, that momentum's only going to grow. There's a global ministerial conference on ending TB in Moscow in November, and the first ever UN high-level meeting on tuberculosis late in 2018. We'll keep you in touch with both of those. Over to you, Gina. 
Thanks, Michelle. Um, thanks for sharing that. And I have also posted in the chat box um, a blog post that was written about that that you can find on our website, results.org.au. Um, so now I'd like to tell you a bit about the people on the call today. And before I introduce our guest speaker, uh, Paul O'Callaghan, Paul, I'd just like to tell you a bit about the kind of people we actually have on the call. We have people like uh, Tian in Canberra, who might want to wave at the screen, <laughs> and the others can see her, even if you can't, Paul. Um, and Tian, despite living in Australia a reasonably short time, and despite having English as an additional language for her, she's lined up her very first meeting with a parliamentarian at Parliament House um, as part of our study tour. And that meeting is one of 18 that we've got so far for the study tour, which is a really great start. And people like um, our Canberra group generally, uh, Roz uh, and Robert and Tian as well, who are doing the Canberra Times Fun Run and our Adelaide group who are doing the City to Bay, our Brisbane team doing the Bridge to Brisbane. And I know Alicia so far is doing the half marathon uh, in the Melbourne Marathon Festival and perhaps some other Melbourne people would like to join her in doing that. And all these people are fundraising for results to add to the $7,500 raised so far this year. And we are aiming for about 23,500 for the year combined from all of the groups. So thank you to all those groups who are currently uh, planning on doing some running for results. Uh, we've also got people like Marie in Hobart um, and all of our other letter writers um, like Peter and like Alicia, people who've had lots of uh, letters published recently. Marie had a published letter recently. Um, she once again used the hook of Roger Federer, who uh, when he won Wimbledon, she wrote a letter talking about his work building schools in Malawi, because uh, it turns out he's uh, built a whole bunch of schools in Malawi. And he, she used that as a great hook to talk about uh, Australian aid and education. And that's one of 60 letters to the editor that we've had so far this year across uh, newspapers across the country. And now I'd like to tell you about our guest speaker, Paul O'Callaghan, who is the CEO of Caritas Australia. Most of you have probably heard about Caritas. They're a Catholic aid and development agency who provide food, water, sanitation supplies, and other emergency supplies during the current famines in East Africa, as well as running long-term programs aiming to improve food security, sanitation, child protection, and gender equality. Paul's got some really extensive experience as a leader in the not-for-profit sector. He's worked at the Department of Foreign Affairs. He's worked in church, church, social and community service bodies. He's been executive director of the Australian Council for International Development and was the co-founder of the Global Facilitation Group, the Australian Disability and Development Consortium and the World Bank's Asia Pacific Civil Society Consultation Group as well as being the Deputy CEO of National Disability Services for four years. Uh, Paul, you've been a very busy man by the sounds of it. Thank you for making some time to come speak to us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. <laughs> no worries at all. Now, Paul, you recently said uh, of the famines in East Africa and Yemen that we haven't seen anything like this kind of crisis in 70 years. What did you see on your visit to Kenya earlier this year? Um, can you paint a bit of a picture of the scene for us? Uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty simple in some ways. Um, the area I went to in eastern Kenya, which is not all that far from the Indian Ocean, um, is a rural area with um, people who are good farmers, um, you know, successful small-scale farmers, um, and uh, who basically people who uh, are able to take care of themselves normally, um, but they've had two seasons with no rain at all. And as a result, um, all the crops have failed for two years uh, and almost all the livestock have died for lack of forage. Um, and uh, this has basically had a cumulative effect, uh, including the stunting of very young uh, babies and toddlers um, up to three years old four years old, uh, I went to a health clinic there and saw just how devastating that had been. That's because the parents are unable to get enough food, really. Um, and so the, the combined effect on this, what I would call successful farming community of this calamity uh, of no rain for such a long period um, is, is really shocking. I mean, we, we have droughts in Australia too, and we've had them, you know, for centuries. But, uh, the difference, I guess, is that 
here uh, in Eastern Africa, there is no backup mechanism. So people do get really desperate. Um, a lot of the young kids that I saw in the health clinic will be dead by the end of this year. Um, they're just so weak and uh, undernourished. And so it's, um, it's really it's quite a jolt. And it's uh, also a, a great reminder of um, our common humanity uh, and the fact that, um, that that expression that most of you would have heard there, but for the grace of God, go I, it, it could be us. If we'd been born there, that could be us. Um, you know, we're very fortunate to be in this country. And um, so I was very struck by the fact that those people uh, in Kenya, there's about 3 million people in this extreme situation on the edge of starvation or many of the young ones already dying. Um, you know, this is something where we need to be contributing uh, as best we can from our societies. Mm -hmm. I know um, my husband and I went to Kenya a couple of years back and, um, you know, the, the area isn't experiencing famine, but the the change in, in the climate and the lack of rainfall was really hitting them hard and they just weren't able to grow rice, you know, like they, like they used to be able to. Um, so we've seen that on a very sort of, far less severe scale so I imagine it was quite horrifying on such a big scale. Um, Paul you've spoken in the media about the lack of awareness amongst Australians and the lower than hoped for donations in response to the famines. Um, there's been a couple of media articles about this. What do you think needs to change to bring these events into the public consciousness the way they were 30 odd years ago with, um, with things like Live Aid? Well, I suspect everyone listening to this is better better informed about this than I am. I, I've found over the last um, three or four months talking to journalists, they keep asking me, why is it that Australians are not responding or not aware? And I, I say to them, well, you know, you guys aren't writing any stories about it. Although there are a couple, as you know, in the Fairfax media, there are a couple of journalists who have tried hard and their editors have let them get material in. But... In the, in the sweep of everything that's happening in our current affairs, you know, with Trump and with North Korea and Brexit and all the other things that are going on, um, it, it's almost hard to believe that with nearly 20 million people on the brink of starvation, you know, in East Africa, that all, very few people in Australia are even aware of it. So I, I think things have changed a lot. Um, in this 30 year period, I really do believe we've become a far more insular society in that period. Um, and I think that's been largely driven by poor political leadership on both sides of politics. Um, a much more kind of myopic view about what's best for us. Um, and if you look at, you know, a lot of the statements that are made by the One Nation group, by Jackie Lambie and others, it's all about, we should just take care of ourselves. We have no responsibility for anyone else. Now, 30 years ago, those sort of strident comments would have attracted a lot of criticism. Now, people just sort of take it as almost normal that that's just part of the debate. And the other thing is, um, I mean, we've had uh, only, you know, three and a half years ago, four years ago, the uh, massive cut in the Australian aid budget. Um, over a quarter of the Australian aid budget was taken away. And as a result of the budget um, this year, the, the, the total effect of this is that um, we're in a position now where, uh, unlike in the last 50 years, where Australia was one of the top 10 uh, in terms of the proportion of giving, um, uh, you would all know when I refer to gross national income, it's not the absolute dollar level, it's the proportion of your gross national income that you're giving. So. We've gone from, you know, a, a reasonable middle level, but in the upper group, we're now heading down to number 19 in the OECD group as a proportion of our gross national income. So we're, we're moving from being one of the rich countries that was really a significant player in the international um, aid and development scene, uh, as well as being actively involved in peacekeeping missions and all of those things. But I would just mention one thing to you, on the humanitarian budget, that has not been cut in the way that the rest of the whole budget has been cut. And in some areas, it's been increased. I mean, the $68 million for East Africa is not great in my sense, because it's, you know, they're looking for, um, the United Nations is actually calling for between two and three billion from the wealthy countries. But 
at least there is a contribution there uh, being made. And uh, by the way, results and other organisations had to um, hassle and hassle to get it increased to that level. But um, my point really is that uh, Australia is now in this position of basically being a, a fairly insular, small scale player relative to what it has been for the last 50 years in this sphere. How do you change that? Look, I, I really believe now in the digital peer, age that we're in, a lot of it is going to be changed through a variety of communications, um, in, engaging young people particularly, um, trying to use whatever um, means possible to, and not necessarily by big aid organisations or anything, but to try and use whatever means possible to bring these matters to the attention of our parliamentary leaders, our national leaders, who by and large just don't want to get involved. This is now, uh, to give you an idea, in the lead up to the 2007 election, federal election, aid and development was roughly somewhere in the top 10 to 12 topics. And in 19 of the electorates around Australia, there were debates, formal debates, every um, contending parliamentarian, you know, of the candidates participated in them. It was organised by ACFID. And now we're in a position where, you know, for a variety of reasons, aid and development is probably about number 30 or 35 or 40. I don't know. It's, it's simply not going to be big in the next election. Uh, the parliamentarians tell me, look, nobody cares about this anymore. It's just not an issue. Nobody's interested. Uh, and we, I think, each in our own way, and some of your colleagues are about to go to Canberra, and I just urge them to, to articulate the view that Australians are people who do have care and compassion and a belief in common humanity, that we are part of this world, that hasn't changed. Um, and we're part of it in lots of ways, including one of the most multicultural societies in the world too. And let's not just pull away from being a really uh, serious contributor. We're still one of the richest countries in the world, despite all of the bleating about deficits and all of that. We're still one of the richest countries. And yet we've gone from being number nine or 10 in a proportion on GNI down to number 19. Uh, that's a political choice, purely a political choice. It's not to do with, you know, other things. You would have seen in the last budget many um, items increased in expenditure, but not this one. So I think we just have to do our best, all of us in the sector, to try and encourage people to pay attention to it as best we can. We do have some friends in the media as well, but it's, it's a really tough call right now, Gina. Mm, thank you for... Um, touching on so many pertinent points there and I know that for me um, I often remind myself that you know if, if there's one thing that we can do it's to show an alternative and show them that people do care people are watching they are taking note <laughs> and they expect better um, and that I think can help us ride through the the waves of the difficult times when it doesn't seem to be going so well um, I would like to invite questions from our callers. Um, if anybody does have a question, please either use the raise your hand button uh, and show me that you've got a question. Um, you can type it into the chat box if you're having any issues with, um, uh, with, you know, with raising your hand. Uh, and if you're on the phone and you've got none of those options, feel free to just um, shout out when you hear a, a lull in the conversation. Hi Paul, I'm Lindley in Adelaide here. If that's all right, Gina, I'll just jump in. Um, have you got any stories of Australian aid uh, giving a positive impact? Because we obviously need to be, continue to be motivated by good stories and we need to be able to tell other people how Australian aid is working. So can you tell us a story from East Kenya of Australian aid at work? Uh, look, at the moment, the I mean, th this really is a, a genuine crisis in these countries. I, I mentioned Kenya to you, um, and there are three million people in, in real tough times there. But if you, if you just go up to South Sudan, it's almost chaos there because you've got the civil war. Political leaders in both of those camps have no interest in their people and are pre prepared to see you know, large numbers of people die as they're migrating from areas with no food at all, trying to get to other areas. I mean, it's, it's absolute desperation. But all I mean by that is to say that there are plenty of examples of where humanitarian aid 
is providing direct assistance. I mean, in, I can tell you about through Caritas, we, we're doing that through our own, in every diocese in Kenya and in South Sudan, we have a direct Caritas agency that's a local agency. So we're, we're actually able in a, I'd have to say in a very modest way, because we, we've only been able to raise one and a half million dollars so far for this, uh, but um, that's proportionately probably better than a lot of other agencies in Australia because, as you know, many of the Australian aid agencies have have said that they're struggling to get any much in the way of donations for this particular crisis. Um, so to, to try and answer your question, there are examples of um, immediate relief through food, water, shelter, medicine in particular in many of these communities, but um, they're probably... It's probably not the best angle, I think, to take when you're dealing with parliamentarians because um, the truth is that uh, the humanitarian part of the official aid program was largely protected for purely political reasons. When I say purely political, it, the fact is that the, both sides of politics know that the Australian community does expect that when there's a typhoon Haiyan or there's a disaster in Fiji or Vanuatu or PNG, that... Australia, Australian official aid money will go in to, to respond. And so there's even been an increase in the humanitarian aid funding to the Pacific um, of over $40 million in the last year. So I, I wouldn't be inclined to focus as much on that. Um, they'll hit, hit back at you anyway and say, well, we've given 68 million and you know we're doing all these other things and so on. I, my recommendation would be with the parliamentarians to point out this thing that Australia has had a fantastic record as a contributor across particularly Asia and the Pacific, but also in parts of Africa with long-term aid and development, particularly in education and healthcare uh, and some other areas um, uh, over many years. And that we, we now have reduced our footprint, if you like, our impact very significantly because the scale of the program has reduced so much. And they, they might argue with you, um, and by the way, the Labor people are not uh, jumping in to say we agree with you particularly because they're not planning to increase the aid budget either. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of bipartisan view at the moment. There's no need to do anything uh, to restore Australia's position of being up in the top 10 in terms of contributing in this area. So I'd be inclined to focus on the fact that we've, we've wound down but there's still many good things um, I mean, in the official aid program. You, you just look at some of the uh, statements that Julie Bishop has made, but also the, um, the departmental, um, you know, the public statements. Um, if you wanted to find something that's a really positive story, particularly about the role of NGOs, look at that effectiveness report that the Office of, De of Development Effectiveness produced early last year, which basically says, this is a glowing part. One of the very best parts of the whole official aid program, $4 billion, is the tiny little bit spent, the 3%, connected to NGOs. They had so many, uh, the independent team that prepared that report found so many examples of significant impact achieved. But it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one. I, I would stay away from slamming them on the humanitarian side. Um, and it's, it sounds odd, but I wouldn't even draw a lot of attention to what agencies are doing at the moment on the humanitarian side because it, it's pretty much normal business for us what we're doing. The hard thing is that a lot of Australians just don't know anything about it. Um, and at one level, I find it amazing that not, because our political leaders on both sides really don't want to increase the aid budget at all, they are not showing any kind of leadership about you know Australia in the international sphere connected to... Um, poverty related issues. They could talk a bit about these issues. They could show some leadership. They could remind Australians that we have been tremendously compassionate and giving people, you know, since the Second World War, we've been actively in this area. But now, basically, due to public policy choices, we've reduced this dramatically. And I'd be asking them to bring it, bring it back over the next, you know, three to six years, something like that. Thanks, Paul. Great question, Lindley. Thank you. Um, are there others who have questions? Please uh, pop your hand up on 
uh, Zoom or just jump in if you're on the phone. Hello. Hello. Yes, hi. What strategies should we employ for communicating with parliamentarians when we bring this issue up? Well, um, the strategy that I use, I call, it's a technical term, stroke and poke. <laughs> stroke means, especially with government people, I mean, I, I deal with Julie Bishop a bit. If you don't start with something positive in the discussion, then it'll tend to go downhill. So there are, there are a number of positive things. If you look at some of the some of the parts of the program, what they're doing, um, you know, on domestic violence in Melanesia. By the way, a lot of our agencies are doing a lot on domestic violence related issues and gender related um, disadvantage, particularly and uh, income generation for women. We're doing a heap too, but you can find two or three things that you can just say, I mean, don't go on for too long, but just for a few minutes indicate something positive, um, particularly looking back in the last six months, um, you know, you could even refer to this expansion of Julie uh, actually launched the, the this new humanitarian uh, assistance program into the Pacific Islands uh, a couple of months ago. Um, that was her initiative. She drove it, um, and you know, it's all it's all good. Um, so there are some positive things. But then, as as soon as you've done that, uh, and bear in mind that many politicians they they know they've only got half an hour with you, so they'll tend to try to talk quite a bit themselves, partly because they don't really want to have to answer your questions. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm being a bit mean. There are many good parliamentarians. But, um, so you need to do the stroke bit. You need to say something positive and smile early on in the conversation. And then you need to indicate that you're there because there is a concern that Australia is uh, no longer actually uh, in the position that it was for 40, 40 to 50 years of being uh, one of the major wealthy countries contributing on aid and development, that you're concerned about this fall. Now, if you're with Julie Bishop, she'll immediately jump in and say, oh, no, no, you've got it wrong. We're, we're actually in the top 10. It depends how you define it, of course. By the OECD standards, that is not true, what she says. But she uses a particular definitional point. I can't remember what it is offhand, but to say that no, Australia is still in the top 10. Um, but actually, you know, we've declined quite significantly in the last four years. So I would then indicate something about what you think would be areas of, you know, trying to beef up the program. You probably will only end up having a short meeting and a very brief opportunity in terms of speaking minutes. So just have in your mind, you know, three or four areas that you would particularly would be recommending um, that they try to work on. But overall, I think you have to say we would want to see a restoration of the Australian program so that Australia returns to being one of the you know, main players in terms of the GNI side of it. And keep it very positive overall, the tone very positive, and just indicate, you know, you're here and you might be able to offer to follow up with some more information. Um, that's what I'd suggest. What leverage do we have? Uh, none, really. There's no leverage. Um, basically, in the absence of um, many, many constituent communications with MPs, they don't take this that seriously. Um, that's why I was saying in 2006, 2007, it was a rare moment, actually, in the last 30, 40 years. It was quite a rare moment. The aid issue became an issue where parliamentarians of all sorts were receiving letters and emails it was coming up on the radio it was on the television journalists were asking them about it and it was a live issue i mean uh, it was pretty amazing to me i got a call from the head of the um liberal party at that time who was the, the you know the administrative head not the uh, parliamentary guy and he said we i would known him for a while he said god paul what are you doing all of these all of our candidates are demanding to get full briefings about the aid program. We can hardly keep up. You know, we're not experts about the aid program here. And uh, he was joking with me, but that was a certain time. That was our absolute high point. 
right now we're at a very low point. And I remember Philip Ruddock from Sydney um, said to me a couple of years ago when I was doing one of these sort of meetings, he said, Paul, you know, after we did the massive cuts in the aid program uh, under Tony Abbott, he said, I didn't get a single letter from a constituent. The only contact I got was from aid agencies who organised, you know, communications. So our problem in a way is that there are, there are relatively few individuals around the country who are prepared to raise it with their own MP or their own senator. And that's, that's really one of the reasons they feel so confident in blowing us off, frankly, and uh, they don't feel threatened in any way. Whereas in 2006, seven, they felt they really had to be up on this topic and both sides made forward commitments. Now, neither side is going to make any forward commitments. I wouldn't expect to get any commitments out of them, but I do think we have to keep batting. We just have to keep going in, keep the tone of it as positive as you can, remind them that, you know, Australians are compassionate, caring people. There is a role for leadership on this at the political level about what Australia is doing. Um, and, uh, but don't assume you've got a lot of uh, leverage at all. Thank you. Excellent questions. And Paul, thank you so much for speaking so candidly to our people today. We don't have time for any more questions. I wonder if you just want to give us like a super short sort of 10 second uh, summary of why do you think we should be hopeful? Well, I'm lucky enough to travel around Australia visiting uh, schools, um, both primary schools and high schools, uh, Catholic ones. And uh, one of the things I find wherever I go is the, the social justice commitment by so many of the students. I don't know whether it's 20% of them or 30% of them. It might vary from school to school, but a lot of the young people who are leaving high school you know, they really want a better world. And that's why they will often talk about climate change, but also they'll talk about the fact that people in countries in parts of Africa, parts of Asia are, you know, are doing it so tough. There, there's a wonderful sense of um, concern there, um, which is at odds with the picture that is often painted of you know, uh, teenagers and people in their early 20s that they don't care about anything except themselves. It's quite the opposite in my experience. And by the way, I've got teenage boys too. Uh, <laughs> but all I'm saying is that I feel incredibly inspired when I travel around and I meet so many uh, people. I'm not saying they're all going to join NGOs or whatever else, but there's, there is a desire to have a better world and a fairer world and um, I'm just thinking, you know, of those Catholic schools, altogether there's 900,000 kids in Catholic schools in Australia. Um, and, you know, a proportion of them are people, whatever they end up doing for a career, they care about these things. I think they'll care about them throughout their lives. And so I'm thinking sort of longer term than just the next three to five, ten years. I think, I think Australia, I think we're going to see some sort of revival of a stronger values base here. Um, and our parliamentarians are going, I think, inevitably to have to respond to that. They've been able to get along for quite a while of, you know, basically not providing much in the way of leadership on any of these issues and like moral leadership. Um, and on the climate change piece, you just look at, I mean, it's, it's just been shocking to, to observe. And it might surprise you to know that I get lobbied by people all around this Asia Pacific region to speak up to the Australian government about climate change policy because uh, it's, it's so noticeable where we are in it. But um, we're not in a good position for lobbying at the moment, but we do have people around us. We need to use any opportunities we can, different sorts of digital forums, um, all sorts of things that can you know, bring people together in different ways than we've done before. And um, we must never give up hope on this. I think, I think there is every reason to feel hopeful, even though we're at a bit of a, a low base at the moment. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, it really it gives me hope to know that yeah, we're at a we're at a low point, but you know, history has shown that we there's high points and there's low points. The high points will come again. The low points need to yep. be endured, and the thing we can't do is just give up and stop talking to our parliamentarians because if we stop, uh, then there's no one. <laughs> 
<laughs> banging yeah, on at them okay. and, and hassling them about this. So uh, thank you so much for your time today. Okay. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, perhaps everyone who is able to mute them, unmute themselves can give you a bit of a round of applause to say thank you. Um, <laughs> it usually takes everyone a moment. Yay! <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. much paul please okay. do feel free to um leave okay. us now and go enjoy the rest yep. of your sunday um it's okay. been great thank you thanks all the best to all of you You're thank you bye-bye <laughs> fabulous um right i just need to find my my notes again because they've disappeared no they haven't here they are um that was that was so interesting and i hope that everybody um got something out of something useful out of listening to, to Paul then and having the questions answered as well. Um, I'd like to share a couple of announcements very quickly before I pass over to Alyssa who will share a grassroots victory for the month. Um, I want to alert everybody as I mentioned towards the start of the call there are some opportunities coming up to run for results. If you go onto our website results.org.au uh, and you have a look under get involved there, you can have a look at ways to fundraise for results. And we do have a list of different fun runs and ways that you can uh, fundraise for results. Um, also, if you look at the events page, we have all the different runs listed there. But I know that coming up is the Bridge to Brisbane, the Melbourne Marathon Festival, the City to Bay, um, the City to Surf, both the Perth version and the Sydney version. Uh, there are lots of fun runs coming up that you can walk in or run in and set up an everyday hero account and raise money for results. We really do appreciate it. And it's one of the easiest ways to fundraise um, because you just set up your page, you ask people to sponsor you to do a run and people give you money. And it's, it's really easy and really fun. So I encourage you to do that. Um, I would also like to point out that uh, anyone who's familiar with our resources page on our website, uh, again, results.org.au, if you have a look under the Get Involved page, uh, there is another page called Access Your Resources and we have a whole bunch of resources on there. I encourage you to go check it out just generally because uh, we have all the guides on there about how to write to your MP and how to get a meeting with your MP, how to write a letter to the editor, um, a list of all the contact details for different newspapers. All these different resources are there and it's very useful. But our very talented grassroots engagement associate, Alyssa, has also created a number of podcast episodes that she has included on some of those pages um, so that they're, so that you can, I, I guess, engage with our resources in a different way. So if you want to hear about how to write an opinion piece or how to meet with your MP, you can actually listen to a podcast episode about those topics as well. So uh, it's a bit of a new project, um, something different. And if you're someone who's into listening and learning through listening more so than reading, then it might be for you. So go check it out. I'd also like to uh, talk a little bit about, um, some of you might know that very recently, the International Conference for Results has been happening in Washington, DC. And I see we've got Mark Rice uh, on our call and he's probably very, very jet lagged. Uh, so I won't make him speak or anything, but um, hello, Mark. Welcome back. Hi, uh, I, <laughs> I think Mark, you got home early this morning, didn't you? Uh, yes, that's right. Good grief. Um, and I know that, um, you know, it's always a really fantastic event and it's always really inspiring, but something that I was inspired by was, you, everyone may have seen on the news um, that they were voting on whether to repeal um, essentially you know, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act um, aspects of Medicaid, basically trying to change laws that helped a whole lot of people get access to medical care and insurance. Um, and I got a I got an email from Joanne Carter, who's the executive director of results in the US. And she said, on Tuesday morning, Senator Susan Collins of Maine helped kick off our annual advocacy day on Capitol Hill. She said to hundreds of results volunteers gathered in Washington, never think your voice doesn't count. Over the last several days, including late last night, we were reminded just how right she was. The defeat of multiple proposals to gut Medicaid and otherwise threaten millions of people's health care is admittedly a complex political story. But this much is clear. Without the grassroots outpouring over the last six months, we wouldn't be where we are today. That includes your more than 250 pieces of media across the country, hundreds of meetings with Congress and thousands of calls, letters and emails that helped make this possible. 
The Senate healthcare votes over the last few days mean that Medicaid stays intact and healthcare for mil tens of millions of Americans is safe for now. The threats to healthcare are not over and we're just beginning to face new threats to other anti-poverty programs. But today we're reminded of what is possible when we raise our voices together. Um, I was quite inspired to see that impact. I know my Facebook feed has been flooded with uh, American results people urging all their Facebook followers to call their senators um, and call and call and call and call for months now. <laughs> uh, Mark, yours is probably the same. And um, to see them get that win and so narrowly uh, as well just shows how important that pressure was to make sure that even if it did get defeated um, or even if it did go ahead, um, they at least had to do so with the voices of lots and lots of people who were um, urging them not to ring in their heads. So that inspired me a whole lot lately. Uh, I would now like to hand over to Alyssa. Um, Alyssa, would you like to take us through this month's grassroots success story? Uh, yep, just let me know at any point if you can't hear me very well, because um, my internet's not always great. Um, <laughs> but because this is the last action call before we head off for the study tour, for this month's victory, I wanted to introduce Nick to everyone, and here's one of our results, Melbourne group members, and he'll be coming with us to Canberra um, for the study tour in two weeks. So is Patrick there? Did you want to say hi? Yeah. Hi, Patrick. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, that's good. Um, so to start, I just wanted to say you're, um, you're quite new to results, and you wanted to join the study tour. So would you like to share uh, why you wanted to come to Canberra so soon after joining us? Uh, yeah, so I only joined in uh, May and uh, I noticed the study tour pretty much straight away and I thought it'd be a good way of just getting, just learning about what results is all about and just getting as, quick, as involved as I could be as quickly as possible. Um, so I wouldn't just sort of fizzle, fizzle out um, in as being part of the, uh, group and um, and from a volunteering sort of point of view, it looked like a perfect fit for me because I was interested in uh, meeting with MPs, learning how to engage with them, uh, operate in a sort of political space, and um, and also there was an opportunity to do some writing and some media work as well. Yes, and is this your first time meeting with the parliamentarian? Um, it's a, my first time meeting with a federal MP. I've met with my state MP, my, uh, the MP for Broadmeadows, Frank McGuire. Um, but it wasn't with a specific uh, issue. It was just a just sort of meeting for maybe the opportunity to volunteer for him or something. Um, so, yeah, so no, I've never um, met with a federal MP, not for a particular cause to advocate um, for anything. And I have never been to Parliament House before either. That's cool. So it'll be your first time going to Parliament House and meeting with a parliamentarian. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, and so, so far you've organised three meetings with different parliamentarians, which I think is pretty impressive um, considering this is your first time. And also I think we've only been allocated about five or six each so far. So that's about 50%, which is really good. And how, could you please tell us a bit about the process you went through to organise those meetings? Sure, yeah, well, it start, started with an email to each of them. Gina, who's running the study tour, gave us a template. Uh, so I followed that mostly, but I tried to personalise it as much as I could for each MP. Uh, did a bit of research into their, sort of what committees they're on and their first speech, and things like that. And I gave a sort of brief story of self, which I tried to keep as short as possible but you know give some of my background about how fortunate I have I feel to live in a safer and prosperous country um, and then after sending the email off uh, sort of I didn't get a response in about four or five days I sort of followed up with a call um, just a sort of quick one just to see if they have any answer and um, this is about it I think I was mainly just uh, lucky to get the some of these who were interested and, and uh, yeah Nice. And have you come across any roadblocks? Uh, not particularly. I've, I'm still uh, I'm still uh, chasing down Greg Hunt. Um, I've, I've been bounced around to a, a diary manager and, and whatnot. I've 
done a couple of follow-up calls, but I'm just I'm just going to see how that pans out. But all the other um, MPs and their staff have been pretty positive, I think. Right, that's excellent. That's good to know that they're they're positive. Sometimes it can be a bit of a turn off thinking that they might be a bit like I don't know. It could be rude. Not that they would, but um, no, and no, also everyone... you're. Oh, that's good. And also you're currently writing your first op-ed um, about your trip to Parliament House and the study tour. So how's that been going? Have you started writing that yet? Um, I've done a little bit of planning, sort of sketching, sketching it out, trying to figure out the, the format. Um, I've never written, yeah, like you said, this is my first one. So I, I, I've been looking at some examples that, that you've sent me actually. And um, so I haven't, I haven't, uh, uh, actually actually finished yet but i think it's it's been an interesting um sort of sort of process figuring out what it what the correct uh format is and uh i think it's been pretty useful because i, I have interest in uh writing especially on political issues um so hopefully i'll get that done pretty soon Great, nice well thank you for that patrick um i wanted to thank you um for sharing all your work with us and talking as well today because um, I personally think it's been really great seeing someone who's so new um, really getting amongst it and taking action, like really going to Parliament House is, is taking action. So, uh, but before we start, um, before we move on, I'd just like to ask if you have any final words of encouragement for everybody on the call today and perhaps the people who aren't going on the study tour as well. Uh, I'd probably just say... Um stick with it, be persistent. Um, you're not, you're not, probably not as annoying as you think. So just um, <laughs> keep, uh, yeah, just, just keep doing it and see, see what comes out of it. Sometimes you, it's, you could get lucky or, or people can be uh, a lot more positive than you think. Nice, okay, thank you so much, Patrick. I like that. You're not as annoying as you think. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, I'll, we'll speak to you soon. And back to Gina. The memorable quotations are flowing thick and fast <laughs> on today's call, aren't they? We've got stroke and poke, and now we've got, you're not as annoying as you think. Like, I feel like these need to be printed on a poster in front of a, in front of a rainbow or a sunset or something. Um, I'd like to, uh, please, um, please do unmute yourself and answer uh, if you know the answer to these questions. Uh, before I throw it to Alyssa to teach us the laser talk, I just want to recap this month's action. Um, so can someone very quickly explain what this month's action is? What are we actually doing? What are you going to do when you get off the phone, ideally? Write to senators. Yeah, writing to senators. Any particular senators? Uh, there's a few key senators from each state listed on page two of the action sheet. Yep. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, so if you have a look on the action sheet, uh, you'll see that there's a list of senators um, colour-coded by state, and so you should write to a senator from your state that appears on that list. Um, and what do we do with those letters? So once I've written my letter to my senator, what are the two things I need to do with it? Uh, you need to send it to that senator, but you also yep. need to give it to the uh, representative from your group or from your state um, who's going to the study tour. Nice. Yep. So um, exactly right. We need to um, send it to our senator. So I've included on there their address so you can stick it in the post and send it to them. Um, but you also need to send a copy and ideally by email is the easiest way send a copy to the representative from your state that is going on the study tour. So again, on the action sheet, if you have a look down the bottom of page two, you'll see a bunch of names. Uh, so we've had different people sign up to be representatives from the different states. So um, in the ACT, we have Bert. If you're from New South Wales, you should send your letter to Daisy. Uh, if you're from Queensland, send it to David. If you're from South Australia, send it to Tom. Tasmania, Lindsay, Victoria, Alicia, and WA, send it to Vanessa. If you're listening in today, uh, or you're listening to a recording, hello. Uh, and if you come from somewhere else, uh, maybe you're overseas, or maybe you're from the Northern Territory, or maybe um, 
those are really the only two places. Uh, maybe you're on another planet, I don't know. Uh, please send it through to Robert and you'll find their email addresses on the action sheet. Uh, and this is really important because the study tour takes place on the, uh, the meetings take place on the 14th and 15th of August. Please get them to the study tour people well before then so they can print them off and take them with them to Canberra. And what we want to do is we want to take in these letters to meetings uh, with these senators and to other parliamentarians. We can make copies and show them that it's not just us. There's actually other people who uh, think the same way we do, who think that Australia could do better, think that our aid program does need to be bigger and does need to be more resilient to cuts, um, that we should be doing more to prevent famines uh, and not just being able to respond to them when they do happen. Um, so we want to take lots of community support, which means also um, get your friends involved. If you can get other people to write letters as well, then that is really helpful because then again, we're uh, not just going in there as a single person, but as someone who is representing the views of a bunch of other people. And if we can uh, demonstrate that with letters, um, then that's really powerful. Uh, great, so I'm gonna throw to Alyssa now to teach us the laser talk, and then I'll be up back at the very end just to say a quick goodbye. Um, so Alyssa, take it away. Okay, so um, for those of you who don't know exactly what a laser talk is, I'm sure most of you do, but um, it's essentially an elevator pitch. So it's a quick way of, of um, being able to communicate our message and what we're doing and also remembering the, the key facts that you'll need to know if you're speaking to a parliamentarian or it contains the core messages that you can use to um, translate into the media or a letter to the editor. So I'm going to teach you all the laser talk that we will be using for our um, famine campaign, which we've only recently kind of written and finalized. So it's quite cool. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out the laser talk once. I'm going to then read it out for a second time and I'm going to emphasize keywords and like anchor, anchor points. The third time I read it out, I'm going to leave gaps. So I'm not going to say those anchor point words. And I'd like everybody to unmute themselves and yell out the missing word to me. And then the fourth time, I'm going to read it out again, but then I'm going to leave out the anchor words and everyone just stays silent and thinks it in their head by themselves. And then afterwards we'll get someone to try and have a go at saying it, which is sometimes a bit difficult, but it, you do get there, definitely. Okay, so it says, imagine being so hungry that you have to eat grass. This is the current reality in four countries, Yemen, South Sudan, Nigeria, and Somalia, where more than 20 million people are at risk of starvation due to famines. Aid is an expression of Australian values to uphold freedom, dignity, and equality and equal opportunity. We are proud of Australia's contribution so far, but we know more aid will be needed. We call on our government to increase Australian humanitarian support for famine relief and rebuild Australia's aid program. So that's the laser talk and I'll read it again. This time I'll emphasize the anchor points. Imagine being no hungry, that you have to eat grass. This is the current reality in four countries, Yemen, South Sudan, Nigeria, and Somalia, where more than 20 million people are at risk of starvation due to famines. Aid is an expression of Australian values to uphold freedom, dignity, and equal opportunity. We are proud, oh sorry, we are proud of Australia's contribution so far, but no more aid will be needed. We call on our government to increase Australian humanitarian support for famine relief and rebuild Australia's aid program. Okay, so I'll read it out for a third time. If everyone could unmute themselves about now, and I'll leave I'll those leave. anchor points blank and yell them out all together. <laughs> all right. Imagine being so hungry that you have to eat grass. Grass, nice. This is the current reality in four countries. Yemen, 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 Yemen South Sudan, Nigeria, South Sudan, Nigeria and Somalia. Nice. <laughs> We're more than 20 million, 20 million people. 
Yeah, 20 million people are at risk of starvation due to famines. It is an expression of Australian values to uphold freedom. Yeah, I think I heard that. Freedom. Nice. Thank you, Lindley. <laughs> we are proud. Yep. Proud of Australia's contributions so far, but no more aid will be needed. We call on our government to increase, increase, increase assistance for famine relief. Aid program. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, to increase, increase, increase Australian humanitarian support for famine relief. And I think I just heard it. Australian aid program. Mm -hmm. Yep, perfect. Right. Excellent. Okay, I will read it one final time. And this time, if you could all mute yourselves again. And when I leave the words blank, um, just think them to yourself silently in your head. All right. Imagine being so hungry that you have to eat grass. This is the current reality in four countries. Yemen, South Sudan, Nigeria, and Somalia, where more than 20 million people are at risk of starvation due to famines. Aid is an expression of Australian values to uphold freedom, dignity, and equal opportunity. We are proud, I saw Gina, of Australia's contributions so far, but no more aid will be needed. We call on our government to increase Australian humanitarian support for famine relief and rebuild Australia's aid program. So hopefully um, you can remember that in to, to some extent. Uh, would someone like to volunteer to have a go at reading it out on their own? Mm. So, Perth. So does anyone want to have a go? I think oh, no. Perth. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Nice. Thanks. Imagine being so hungry that you were forced to eat grass. This is the current situation in four countries, Nigeria, Somalia, South Sudan, Kenya. Yemen, but Yemen. close. Yemen. <laughs> yeah. Um, where more than 20 million people are at risk of starvation. They, yes, no. Yes. We call on the Australian government to increase its aid budget. Uh, no, that, that, no. That's one of them. I think you, you skipped two lines. No, that, that was quite good, though, because um, I think it, it's learning those, those anchor points, and it's something that if you have one or two more goes at you, you will get. Um, I didn't get it on the first time either um, but after the 20 million it's aid is an expression of Australian values to uphold uh, freedom dignity and equal opportunity and then we are proud of Australia's contribution so far but no more aid will be needed um, which I guess connects to what um, Paul was saying about trying to stroke and poke that's the the stroking I guess um, and then we call on our government to increase Australian humanitarian support for famine relief and rebuild Australia's aid program so thank you. Uh, Gina, would you like to take over? Will do. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, I've sent a copy of that uh, laser talk to all of the group leaders. So um, anyone who's meeting in a group today, you'll have access to that so you can keep practicing. And I do encourage everyone to have a go at turning to the person next to them and giving it one last shot uh, when we hang up the phone. So thanks everyone for joining today's call. And if you do need support taking your action, please get in touch with your group leader or get in touch with info at results.org.au. And please tell us what actions you're taking by reporting them at results.org.au slash report. It helps us to know how active people are. It helps us to know where people might be needing help. 
uh, and it helps us to figure out where we can um, leverage, you know, where a whole bunch of, bunch of people are taking an action and kind of combine the, the power of that action together and make it more powerful. Uh, so if we know what you're doing, we're able to figure out how better to use it. Uh, so please do report your actions at results.org.au slash report. Our next action call, and it'll be my last action call, uh, is taking place on Sunday, August 27 at 3.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Now, as always, a recording of this call will be made available and sent out uh, shortly for anyone who wants to review it or to share it with somebody else. I'm going to leave you today with the words of Desmond Tutu uh, because I feel like everyone needs a little bit of hope and a bit of encouragement and uh, a bit of help to get us through this, this dip that we talked about. Um, Desmond Tutu said, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. So I hope that you're able to get in touch with the light uh, and not just the darkness. And I encourage you to keep working to shine your light on the world um, show our parliamentarians that people care and that we expect better from them and uh, make your mark. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and see you next month. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.